Hey folks, it's Mira Desi, the Ingredient Guru, and I am here taking over the Facebook page at the Nutritional Therapy Association. I wanted to take a chance to talk to you about the new program that's coming out and share some really great information with you. And we'll leave some time for questions, so if you've got them, be sure to put them in the chat box. Um, I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about me. I'm Mira Desi, I'm the Ingredient Guru, and I help functional medicine practitioners incorporate a deep dive into ingredients and functional nutrition into their practice. This allows them to help their clients get better faster. And it also allows you to incorporate information that I believe to be foundational to any practice, regardless of, of what your niche is, because ingredients are in everything we eat, so we need to know about them. Um, you know, my, my personal story, how I came to be the ingredient guru is kind of an interesting one. I, um, this is, this is my third career and I previously was a database administrator. I worked for a large, uh, international research company and I liked my job. I was good at it. It was kind of fun. I enjoy working with data, but along the way I became very, very ill. And my, as my health began to decline, I started having to incorporate more and more doctors into my life. I also wound up, uh, sadly, incorporating a whole bunch more pharmaceuticals into my life. And I wasn't getting any better. In fact, I was getting worse. And for me, one of the things that happened was that as I, as I followed the mainstream medical model, nobody talked to me about my food. They just kept referring me to more people and they kept um, encouraging me to, you know, take more medicine, that kind of thing. So I, I at some point finally had sort of a breakthrough moment. I had two things that happened in the same week. One was my endocrinologist said to me, I, sorry, my rheumatologist said, I want to give you this medicine, but I believe that your endocrinologist won't like it. So I'm not going to do it. And in the office, I said, okay. And then as I was driving home, I realized that I was getting angrier and angrier because if he wasn't going to do that, why would he tell me? And weren't they both doctors? And couldn't they just pick up the phone and call each other? And it turns out the answer to that question is not always. Uh, the second thing that happened was I went to a new-to-me cardiologist. And as I tried to share my story with him, his response was, Mrs. Desi, you are getting older. I was 42 years old, and so I was all of a sudden very overwhelmed by that and very angry. And that those two things together in that same week made me realize that I needed to make a change or I was going to be living on the sofa for the rest of my life. So I began to learn more about food, educate myself, do the things that I could do, change the things I could change, and at a certain point realized that I had to go back to school. I, I had taught myself everything I thought I could, and I needed to go back to school, so I did, and became a nutrition professional, and began to go out into the world and, and help other people. And one of the things that I discovered was that ingredients were way more important than we had been taught. And that kind of became my life's work and my passion. And so I spend a lot of time researching ingredients and talking about all different kinds of things that are going on with our food, food policy, food fraud. Um, basically, I do the research so you don't have to. So that's what makes me who I am. <laughs> and makes me the ingredient guru and why I'm here in front of you today. So one of the things that I'm really happy about though is that I'm presenting this to you on behalf of the Nutritional Therapy Association. I first came into contact with the organization a number of years ago when one of my friends was going to the conference and said, hey, wanna come help me? And so I was her booth assistant, and I all of a sudden met this incredibly heart-centered community, these amazing practitioners, and all the things that you taught and believed were totally in line with what I believed as well. And I made friends with a number of the practitioners, and we stayed in touch, and I started going back to the conferences and getting to know more and more people and more and more about the program. And it's really been a very wonderful thing. 
I love how the Nutritional Therapy Association has different class settings around the country to bring it to as many people as possible. Now, of course, they're all around the world, which is awesome, very cool stuff and growing. Um, but you're putting people in the places where they are on the ground to give them the education so they can go out into the world and make a change. There are so many people who need this support, who need the information that we have to share, who need the guidance, the coaching, and to be able to make those changes. You know, a lot of people think they can do it by themselves. And while we may know what we need to do, and truthfully, a lot of times we don't, especially when it comes to food. But when we may think that we do, that we do, we do, do, it's or to go with us because that gives us a foundation and a, a support system that ultimately helps us to be more successful. So, um, you know, one of the, as I said, you know, my, my big passion. My nerdly moments are going to the grocery store and researching what's in our food and being really involved in what's happening in the world of food. And it's kind of funny because my family won't even go to the grocery store with me anymore because when I'm there, I read labels on things I have no intention of buying just so I can see what they're doing. Um, I also spend massive amounts of time researching and reading what's going on in the world of food. So I, I love that. My big project right now that I'm working on is to uh, create a, a, another book that goes a deeper dive into my book, The Pantry Principle, so that I can share more information and help more people with that. And then I'm always looking to create programs that are foundational and supportive for practitioners so that they can incorporate the information that I have into what they're doing. And truthfully, that's why I was so excited when the NTA contacted me and asked me if I would be willing to be a part of this program and do the class because I, I was just thrilled. And, you know, to be able to take people to the grocery store and we're running around the aisles. And actually it was really funny because most of you, by the time you're done with your classes, you don't even go down some of those grocery store aisles unless you're leading grocery tours, unless you're taking your people to the grocery store. And so it, it was really funny because some of the people that I was shopping with uh, were going, I don't know where that is. I'm like, I know what section it's in. So we would go over there and find it. Um, that was a lot of fun. But then also just to be able to be there in a beautiful kitchen, sharing the pantry with you, sharing information so that you can take that to your, to your clients and to help them to improve their health and to reach their health goals is really one of the most important things that we can do. Um, so the, the section of the program that I'm in is called Design Your Environment. And I'd love to take just a minute to read the description of that so that you can understand what it is and why this is so important. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read from the description here. It says, we might not be able to control everything that goes on out in the world, but we can at least control what foods we decide to buy and which we decide to keep in our homes. It can be difficult to make healthy choices when we are surrounded by seemingly endless foods, products, and social obligations that can derail our best efforts. By proactively designing your environment and learning how to deal with these obstacles effectively, you enable yourself to make consistent forward progress towards your health goals. In this module, you will learn how to give your fridge and pantry a makeover. Always fun. I love doing that and define your why, create effective systems, and be able to take action. And that truly is the most important part. You can create all the systems you want, but if you don't implement them or if you don't support your clients so that they can implement it, things aren't going to move forward. We have to stop shopping on autopilot. We have to stop cooking on autopilot and learn how to truly nourish our bodies and be able to go forward. Um, one of the other things that we talk about um, in this module is how to how to manage social pressure and resistance from people around us. You know, it, it's such a true thing. I have so many people who talk to me sometimes about how do you deal with, you know, you're over at your Aunt Betsy's house and 
you've already had seconds and now Betsy comes around with a pot and goes, ah, a little more won't kill you. And she's putting things in there and you're like, I really didn't want serving one or two. How do you deal with that? Or when people make fun of you for the choices that you make when you're shopping or how do you engender change? Um, you know, I, I'll share, I, I remember very clearly when I was, when I was really incorporating this into our home and making massive changes, I still had three small children living at home. And uh, I was in the grocery store with one of my daughters and we were having this very loud argument. I'm sure all the other people in the grocery store were like, yeah, I don't know that I want to know you folks. Like, I don't know what's going on there. And she was angry because I was taking away her favorite juice. And I was defiant because I wasn't going to have high fructose corn syrup in my home ever again. Now, at the time, it turned into a screaming match. I have since learned that sometimes you have to make changes by degrees. Other times you have to make compromises, but you always have to present it in a way that's seen as a win for the other person. So we talk about those kinds of things. Um, you'll also be provided with resources that make it easier for you to be able to redesign your environment so that you can support your best health. You're learning about household toxins. You're learning about recipes for things that you can do to make cleaners. I mean, there's so many wonderful practitioners in this model who are sharing so much information that are really going to make it exactly what you need it to be. And you know, one of the things that is really important about all of this, and I, I stress this all the time when I'm working with practitioners and when I'm working with clients and when they're working with clients, we really want to make sure that we are taking this in a mindful step-by-step -step fashion. Wherever you are in your life journey, you've been operating on autopilot until you got to this point. And now, all of a sudden, you're in this situation where you're trying to make changes. And you know, our, our human instinct is to say, oh, I'm just gonna do it all. I'm gonna do it all right now. I'm gonna get it all taken care of. And I guarantee if you try to do that, if you're really, really good and really determined, I give you maybe three days, most people too. And then you're like, I'm done because it's so difficult. And so what we want to do instead is make small, mindful, measurable changes that we can implement. Baby steps is the key to success. We have to learn to do a little bit at a time. Oh, I see Kathy just joined us. Hi, Kathy. Um, Oh, and I have a couple of other people too, Rebecca and Kristen. Hey guys, thanks for joining in. That's so great. Um, so, so we want to make small measurable changes. We want to do it a little bit at a time. Master the thing that's in front of you and then move on to the next thing. Don't look ahead and have, you know, this overwhelming frustration because I'm not getting it or it's not getting done fast enough. Because I promise you, every single thing that you do is one step more than you were doing before. So for example, when it comes to ingredients that are in food, for me on my personal journey, the very first thing that I did was to remove artificial colors from the diet. So I just went through, first of all, it was really easy to identify. I had just learned how horrible these are for our brain. They're made from petrochemicals, they're overstimulating, and actually, believe it or not, there was this huge landmark study that was done that showed that artificial colors impacted even people who didn't have neurobiological issues. So kids with attention-related disorders or other things like that, it affected them, and it was a problem. But even people who didn't have that had issues because of what it does to the brain. So I was determined it was going to come out of my pantry, and I was shocked at how much I had in my home. Because, you know, at that time, before I became the ingredient guru, I, I honestly believe I was probably eating better than 80% of my friends. Most of my friends, the people I worked with, my family, they're like, oh my gosh, you just, you are so good. You eat so well. And we belong to a farmer's market and we had a, you know, a CSA and we would go out and visit the farm and pick our own. 
I was baking all of our bread from scratch. I was making jams and jellies and pickles and all of that. I was doing all of these things, but I was also still buying food that was not a good choice, that didn't have the ingredients that supported nourishing our body, instead had things that were depleting our health. And I wound up in my family becoming the canary in the coal mine. I was the one that got sick that let us know that we needed to make these changes. So I, I removed all the artificial colors. It's easy to identify because all you do is, is to be able to look at the label and see that number. That makes it a, a very simple no-brainer. You can put it back on the shelf. And Jenna says, I was shocked when I realized that most pickles have food coloring in them. I know, right? Like you look at a jar of pickles and you think that can't be colored. Like that doesn't look like it has color, but it does. They put the artificial colors in there so that it has a semi-green tint to it and to keep it from turning sort of brown as it, gets, as, it, as it ages or gets impacted by the vinegars. So here's the question. Because you brought up the artificial colors in pickles, I'll throw this one back at you. So what do you do? Like, how, What's the answer? Well, there's a couple different things that you can do. One is if you switch to lacto-fermented pickled foods, those don't have artificial color in them. So that's a great choice because that's a nourishing food and it's really wonderful. What if your client's not ready for that? Well, one of the things that you can do is you can look in a different section, in that section, but on a different shelf usually, and look for uh, foods that come from international markets. You know, maybe, maybe the pickles are from Poland or somewhere else. They tend to not, um, not use the artificial colors as much as we do. And then the third option is to learn to make your own. They're actually not that hard to make. Um, you know, one of the things that was always fun for me is I would teach other people how to make pickles or how to make jam because my, I grew up doing it, doing it, watching my mother do it. You know, she grew up watching her mother do it. There's like a big family history of it. So it was sort of part of our family culture, I guess. But when you have someone who's never done it before and you show them how simple it is, invariably they go, that's it. Like, yes, that's it. It's so easy. And then you're the one who's in control of what's in what you eat. Because the truth of the matter is, you know, it, it, it's not just what we eat. That is in a very important part of it. And when we're working with clients, we want to look at their food choices and help them make changes and challenges that are a good fit for their bio individual body. But it's more than that. The foundational level that I was talking about is to look at the ingredients. What's in what you eat? What are the things that are added to your food? Because I promise you, none of those things are added for your health. They are added for manufacturer convenience. They are emulsifiers. They are stabilizers. They are preservatives. They are you know, food coloring, a whole bunch of other things that are put in there because it's cheaper and easier. And so in the class, we talk about those kinds of things. We also look at different ways to, to find some, some action steps that people can take in order to be able to include that. You know, one of the, one of the things that happened for me as I was going along this journey, it's actually kind of funny, um, I, I'm a little slow on the uptake. I'm just going to say that up front. So I started taking people to the grocery store. I started going through their pantries with them and I started helping them. And I got really frustrated at one point because I realized that I was giving the same handouts over and over again. And I thought, there's got to be a way to jumpstart this conversation. Why is it so hard to find all of this? Why is it not, you know, in one place where it's easy to access? And then all of a sudden one day I went, well, wait a minute, <laughs> I could write a book. And so I did, and I wrote The Pantry Principle, which is actually, whoops, sorry, that book in the background there. The Pantry Principle, How to Read the Label and Understand What's Really in Your Food, which is part of this program. It is a well-researched, chapter-by-chapter look at all of the different things that they do to our food. And, you know, having these kinds of resources and having this information allows you to add something else to what you're offering because you're giving people back control over their food. As the ingredient guru, my, my passion and my mission is to educate. I, I want to know what's going on so that I can speak up about it, but then I also really, really want to educate 
millions of people. I want to change the paradigm of food in this country, and I need your help to do it because we need to go out there and educate consumers so that when they're at the grocery store or when they're making food choices, they are choosing things that are the correct choice for them that will truly support their health, their wellness, and allow them to be able to live the lives that they want. And so these are all different things that are incorporated into the program. And it's not just me in this module. You know, we're, we're also looking at household cleaners and toxins and environmental things and air quality. Like this is such a phenomenal module because you are learning how to help someone rewrite their life and redo their environment so that they have the best, most optimal um, situation for themselves. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of different things that we can look at when we're doing these. And when we take it step by step, when we learn it in a framework like this, one of the first things you want to do, obviously, is look at your own life and begin to make those changes there. Because as you live through it and walk it, you then have the ability to be able to help the people that you're working with because you know where they're coming from, you know their, their resource and their framework. And so that's a great thing. Um, the other thing that I really encourage people to do is get curious. You know, it, it's so funny, when I first began to do this, I, I was clueless. Most people are clueless. Like we go to the grocery store, we, we know the route of our grocery store, we have the same 20 foods that we like to buy, maybe a couple of new snacks here and there, and that's it. And we get really upset when they reset the grocery store, which, by the way, they do on a regular basis because they are trying to convince you to buy more stuff. The more time you spend in the grocery store, the more likely you are to buy things. And part of the reason for that is they know most people go to the grocery store hungry, even though we know we shouldn't. And they have smells in the grocery store that trigger a response in us. And so you may walk into the grocery store feeling great, but two thirds of the way through, you're like, man, I need something to eat. Or your, your resistance is low and you're like, oh, one bag of chips won't hurt, you know, that kind of thing. So learning how to avoid some of those things and shop smarter and understand some of the manipulation behind what's going on, those are all really important. But even more than that, to just have that commitment, that focus to those baby steps that will allow you to go through the process of reclaiming your pantry and revitalizing how you feed your family and what you do. So those are, those are the kinds of things that we talk about. Those are the kinds of things that we cover. And I'm so excited to share this. I'm wondering if anybody has any questions for me while I'm sitting here, because I could talk all day, but I don't want to suck up all the time if anyone has questions. So wait just a second. Okay, no questions at the moment, so I'll just keep talking. But if you guys have questions, like, leave me a message and I will do my best to answer you. Um, you know, one of the other things that I think is really important when we are looking at making these changes is to have a good resource, to have information that you can trust and that you can rely on so that you know what's going on. Because one of the most important things that happens is the changes, some of the changes, not all of them, but some of the changes that happen, we're asked, the FDA and the USDA, they ask for public commentary. Most people don't respond because they don't know what's out there. And I make it my job to find out about those and to tell you to put it out through my newsletter. I have a newsletter, it's called Food News You Can Use. And every week I put out a, you know, an editorial and three or four blurbs about what's going on with food, whether it's food policy or other things like that. To have resources like that that you can use to share with your clients helps to support what's going on because what we're looking for is the ability to educate. We're looking to make those changes. We're also, again, looking at doing things in a way that meets our bio-individual needs or their bio-individual needs and doing it um, in a measurable fashion or a supported fashion. 
because if we go too quickly or if it's too overwhelming or if it hasn't been absorbed because you know we we need to look at how are we cooking with them how are we supporting them what are other lifestyle things that we're looking at to help them so that we can build this wonderful healthy supportive lifestyle holistic lifestyle that will allow them to move forward with their goals and when we do those things we create someone who becomes an avenger <laughs> i mean i have to tell you there are so many people where you begin to work with them and they're there because they want to see you and they're working with you and then they begin the more they begin to learn the more fired up they get and they think why is it this way why why did nobody tell me why are they doing this to my food why are they doing this to you know things in our environment why didn't my doctor tell me those are things that i hear a lot and you will hear those as well um, because we have to take that back we have to take that action step and learn how to make that change and make that difference and so by taking a program like this you get so much education and you wind up becoming a practitioner who can move into the world with a mission and you inspire all those people around you it becomes a truly wonderful thing we are building a network and a framework for wellness that is unstoppable and so that's a really wonderful thing to have especially when we look at all of the different pieces and parts that we cover and that's one of the things that actually makes us unique you know as practitioners we are looking at whole body systems we are looking at nurturing on different levels and that allows us to build a deeper and closer connection with our clients and truthfully with people that we come into contact with even if they're not clients because you will wind up living and breathing that lifestyle so you demonstrate by example and that is going to have an impact as well so as we move forward with those things we are you know going to be able to to make a change to have that impact so i do i do have um a question here oh um russ debbie says hello hi and and kathy easton says what is the most surprising hidden ingredient you found in food um and then she says besides the pickle coloring <laughs> so here's the thing the most surprising thing i found in food actually isn't on the label which is really horrible and really awful and totally legal so that part i hate um for me there are so many of them it's hard to pick one but one of the ones that i wind up talking to people about because it can be a good example is propylene glycol so propylene glycol is essentially like an antifreeze it's it's very similar chemically to antifreeze and what it does is it keeps ice cream from getting crystallized and hard. So it keeps it nice and soft and scoopable and easy to serve. However, there are some food producers that will put it on the label, but the vast majority of them don't, and they are not legally obligated to because it is part of the process and not part of the food. And so the way food is defined, that gives them a loophole, and many of them take advantage of it. Now, having said that, not everyone reads the label. So some people are going to go propylene glycol, like I've never seen that, and maybe you haven't. There are going to be a whole bunch of other people who are going to go, I don't read labels, and we need to read the label because we need to know. But if it's not on there, it makes it difficult to identify. And so then we have to start doing our own investigations and learning how to make those changes. What's the solution if you think there's propylene glycol in your ice cream, other than not buying it, of course? is uh, to, to make your own. Again, very simple to do, or to find a brand that you trust that doesn't have it in it. And there are brands out there, uh, but you, you have to do some detective work. The other startling ingredient that everyone always likes to talk about, and so I will mention it here because it, it does come up on a fairly regular basis, is something called castoreum. And castoreum is never, ever, I have only once ever seen it identified on the label. And if you go to my blog and you type, if you go to the internet and you type Mira Desi castoreum, the article will come up. Um, I've only ever once seen it on the label. The rest of the time it hides. What do they call it, you ask? 
They call it natural vanilla flavor, natural strawberry flavor, or natural raspberry flavor. So I hate that word natural. Like that could be a whole hour by itself but it's a way for them to hide a whole bunch of different things that they're doing and it's, it's not great. Uh, because they put that word natural flavor on there and identify it by you know, what it is in terms of vanilla, strawberry, or raspberry, a lot of people think that it's related to the, the fruit and it turns out it's not. Um, so castoreum is the anal gland secretion of beavers. I refer to it as beaver butt. And um, not great, but they do include it in food and they also include it in things like cigarettes. Um, actually, they've taken it out of cigarettes now because too many people found out about it, but they were using it in cigarettes as part of the flavoring. And, you know, it's, it's kind of gross. Um, it, it, I guess this anal secretion does have sort of a vanilla scent to it. And so a lot of people don't, um, you know, don't, don't pay attention, I guess, because they think it's a natural vanilla, but it's not. It's from castoreum. The challenge is they don't use a lot of it, and so you don't know where it is. My advice is as much as you can, if it says natural flavor, whatever it is, try to avoid it. Um, I, I will confess, in all the years that I've been doing food lectures and talking to people about ingredients and what's in their food, I only once ever had someone ask me, I had a gentleman say, is it bad for you? And the answer is not really. It actually is not harmful for you. And there is a homeopathic remedy using castoreum. But, oh, I guess that would be the second place that I've seen castoreum on the label. You can actually buy little pellets. Um, but for me, it is the idea that they would put something in our food and not tell us what it is because they knew it had a high ick factor. Um, that's, you know, that's like when they put bugs in food, there, um, you know, there, there are these bugs called cochineal bugs. And the, when you crush them, they have this red cast to them. And so they use them as a dye. So first of all, if you're vegan or even vegetarian, you don't want to eat bugs. Um, it's just part of your dietary preference. And some people, uh, for religious reasons, can't eat bugs. It's against their religion, truthfully. And so to have that dye in the food and not identify it because it's identified as carmine or as cochineal, but it's not, it doesn't say it's from bugs. It's just cochineal. And so that's something that's very challenging. Um, I do talk about this in the book. It was kind of funny. There was a period in time where Starbucks switched from a, um, a berry extract to make the red for their strawberry frappuccinos and they switched to cochineal because it's cheaper and easier. And, uh, but this being the age of the internet, somebody found out and they told and the hue and cry was incredible. And in very short order, Starbucks went back to their original formulation. Now, whether you're a fan of Starbucks or not is not the issue here. And whether you are someone who believes that, you know, eating, eating bugs is a great protein source or, you know, we shouldn't ever eat bugs or whatever, whatever your philosophy is on that. Like, I really have no skin in that game. What I do care about is two things. One, we really should know what's in what we eat. If we're going to put it in our mouth, we have a right to understand what it is and what the potential impact is. Two. That Starbucks story, you have so much power. All these people got together and stopped buying strawberry frappuccinos and started griping all over the internet that Starbucks had made this change and that people were upset and that they were never going to buy it again, et cetera, et cetera. And this major corporation caved because they had to. Because here's one of the simple truths that we need to understand about our food. All of those companies that make food out there, they're not in the business of making food, people. They're in the business of making money. Food is the product that they use to make money. And if you won't buy it and eat it, they won't make it. And so the more we can make a change, the more they listen. And things have, have happened, you know, it is, it is beginning to change. 
Um, so I see a question here. Jenna wants to know, I always wonder who is the first to test castoreum? Yeah, I have not been able to find that out. Um, the most I've been able to find out in my research, because yeah, really, who wants to do that? Um, the most I've been able to find out in my research is that it was a, um, a byproduct of the beaver trade because a long time ago, last century, there was a huge beaver trade because people were wearing beaver coats, beaver hats, beaver muffs, you know, and so as they were skinning the beavers, I guess, they noticed that it had an aroma and somehow someone decided, I guess, I don't know, that it would be good. Still not sure. So I don't know who the first person was. Um, not sure that was a wise decision on their part, but apparently it worked out okay. You know, that's one of the other things I wonder about sometimes though, just as a, a silly side note, there are a whole bunch of things that we eat that um, are okay. But like, who was the first person who smelled garlic and said, gee, I think that that, that might taste good. <laughs> like, because there gotta be other people out there who ate stuff and went, oh, that, that smells really delicious and didn't work out so well. So like, I have no idea how we come to these things. But then what happens is at a certain point, food producers step in and they're like, we have to come up with a better way. Like we can't be growing all this garlic. So we got to create a garlic extract or we got to create these chemicals that make the colors exactly the same all the time. Or we got to create an emulsifier so things don't separate. You know, all those kinds of things happen. It's for convenience. It's not because it's the best option for us. Um, Kathy Eason says, I'm okay with ground up bugs. I am not okay with chemical neurotoxins. So true. I, I agree that, you know, again, it's about the choice. It's about understanding what's going on and giving us the information because food producers don't really want you to know. And when we wind up having something that we find out about, their first option invariably is some kind of a misdirection campaign. So there's two that I'd like to share with you. The first one is about high fructose corn syrup. And I don't, I don't know how many of you remember this. And you can probably Google it. Actually, I should go Google it and look it up on YouTube. There used to be these commercials where a couple people in a park, a whole bunch of kids playing in the background, and one mom says to the other mom, hey, want a popsicle? And the second mom goes, oh, no, it has high fructose corn syrup in it. And the other mom goes, really? What's wrong with high fructose corn syrup? And the second mom goes, uh, like she doesn't know what she's talking about. So we now know high fructose corn syrup is absolutely awful for you rots your liver and is just has negative negative health consequences but in the beginning it was used very readily because it is a cheap 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 source of sugar and we are biologically programmed to love sugar and so if they can put it in things that works out better for them and if it comes from corn which is a super cheap commodity even better so it just sort of all feeds the machine if you will they tried to convince us it was really bad that didn't work out so hot so then they tried to change the name. They tried to change it to corn sugar, thinking that if they could give it a different name that people wouldn't be so opposed to it. Luckily for us, the um, government, that, well, the legal system shut them down and said, there is no reason whatsoever for you to change the name of your product. No, you cannot do it. So it's still high fructose corn syrup. More and more people stopped buying things with high fructose corn syrup in them. And then what happened? Now there are products that on the front of the label, in big letters, it says no HFCS, no high fructose corn syrup, because they know people want that. Now, are you still going to find things with high fructose corn syrup? Yes, absolutely. You know, the other day I was out at a restaurant, which I was very disappointed, very clean restaurant. Um, you know, the food was good. It was really fabulous. But they plopped a bottle of, you know, which brand starts with an H, ends with a Z. And I flipped it around just to look because some of them don't have it. And this one did. High fructose corn syrup ingredient number two on the label. Not a great choice. So, um, so, but because we spoke up, because we said we didn't want to eat that, they stopped. So that's definitely one good thing. Um, the other thing that I wanted to address is Rebecca talks about, I'm concerned about the dishonesty. I totally agree with you on that one. And, you know, one of the things that I want to share, I'm going to share this story with you. This has so much to do with dishonesty. Corporations are forever trying to do whatever it will take to convince you to buy their product. And sometimes that means maybe not telling you everything, just telling you a little bit to make themselves look like the good guy or to make them seem like they're concerned and caring. So, um, there was a, a young adolescent 
who apparently noticed that their Gatorade had something called brominated vegetable oil, BVO, in it. And they looked it up and discovered that essentially it's flame retardant. Yes, flame retardant. In Gatorade. Not sure why it's there. I'll tell you why in just a minute. But they wrote to um, PepsiCo, who owns Gatorade, and said, why is there brominated vegetable oil in, in my Gatorade? Like, I'm a soccer player. I drink this stuff all the time. I don't think that, that this should be in there. It's really bad for you. And I don't know how it got enough attention, but it did. I mean, basically got picked up by small news media and then sort of grew bigger until PepsiCo finally responded. And they removed the brominated vegetable oil from Gatorade. Then they started this huge ad campaign. They said, look what great corporate citizens we are. We have removed BVO from Gatorade. Yay for us. And a lot of people were congratulating them. Do I give them kudos for removing it? Yes, I do. Absolutely. They made a change and hopefully it had an impact. However, what they didn't tell people is it was still in their other products. Anybody flipped over a bottle of Mountain Dew lately? It still has brominated vegetable oil in it last time I checked. Granted, it's been a while since I've looked at the label. So now I got to go back to the store and look again. But it was still in their other products. They only removed it from one product. That's like when Kraft started removing artificial colors from their macaroni and cheese. They removed it in Europe years ago, but they didn't remove it here for the longest time until, until it got so much press that they finally did. But even when they did, they didn't remove it from all of the products. They only removed it from most of them. That kind of stuff drives me absolutely crazy. And that's why we need to educate. That's why we need to be informed. And that's why we need to speak up. Oh, I promised to tell you what brominated vegetable oil is in there for. Brominated vegetable oil is put into citrus drinks because it helps keep the citrus oil um, homogenized into the drink. So it keeps it from separating, essentially. So that's why they put it in there. Um, so going back, yes, you know, they are doing these things. They pat themselves on the back. They tell themselves that they're really good at what they're doing and we should trust them because they have our best interests at heart and look at how responsive they are. But then they don't tell us all the other stuff that they're doing. Um, you know, there are, there are tons of industry newsletters out there talking about how to take advantage of clean labeling. Well, there's no advantage to be taken care of, folks. You, you just want to make sure that you're doing the right thing by the people that we're dealing with. So those are the kinds of things that you're up against. And that's the stuff that I do. Like I said, I do the research so that you don't have to. And, um, you know, I'd love to encourage you to connect with me. You can, you know, check my newsletter, check my, my Facebook page, um, check my Instagram, those kinds of things, because I share these things so that you can then share them forward. Let's be really honest. I can't reach everybody by myself. I mean, it, it would, it's not possible. But if you can learn this stuff too and add this foundational information to what you're doing and understand how to help people make these changes, you are going to make such a huge difference. And it doesn't matter if your niche focus becomes, you know, diabetes or pregnancy or autism or arthritis or whatever it is. If you add in the foundation of ingredients into all of the food choices that you're making and you teach people how to become more aware, you are giving them a huge gift. And so that is just one of the most wonderful things you can do as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, so that's where we are with that. Let's see if we have any more questions. Oh, we have a few more questions. Let's see. Erin Liber says, I feel empowered when I can see an ingredient label though more difficult in restaurants, food counters, and food trucks, especially with a line behind you. Yes, Erin, totally agree on that one. Um, at parties and friends' homes, I still ask about what's in something before ordering, no matter how difficult it feels to speak up. Yes, absolutely. And you know, one of the things that I really encourage people to do, more and more restaurants are putting their um, menus and ingredient lists online. And so if you know you're going somewhere, you can ask. Um, I have even encouraged people at the deli counter, ask them to haul that, you know, whatever it is, I don't know, chicken breast out of the counter and show you the label. We're so used to just ordering with everything sort of sanitary back there and they're slicing and wrapping and, 
and we don't ever see the packaging, but we have the right to ask to look at the label. And when you go to certain restaurants, um, I know Panera does this. I know, you know, some of the, the fast casual places do this. They have these books under the counter. Now, the truth of the matter is a lot of those books are there because of food intolerance issues. And so if someone wants to say, hey, is there dairy in that or are there eggs in this or whatever, they can pull it out and look it up and see what's in there. But they list all the ingredients. So you can ask to see what's in whatever it is that you're going to buy. Um, now, not every restaurant has that, but for the ones that do, that's a great choice because then you have the ability to make those changes. The other thing that I, um, I do want to sort of piggyback on what Aaron said in terms of not being able to control it, there are certain times when you have to accept that you can only do as much as you can do. I, you know, I travel on a regular basis, speaking all over the country, and when I'm on the road, there's, I can have some control over my food, but I don't have 100% control. I can't bring everything with me. I can't always control where I'm going. And so my goal is to make sure that my home environment is as clean as possible the majority of the time. And then, you know, my body will deal with the rest. I'm still making choices when I'm out and about. I'm, I'm still looking to do the best I can, but I'm not going to get wrapped around the axle about not having everything be perfect or exactly what we need. Um, so let's see, Jenna wants to know, is my, F, is my Facebook page the Ingredient Guru or my name? It's my name. So to get to my Facebook page, it would be Facebook forward slash Mira Desi NE for Nutrition Educator. Um, Holly Frank says, I'm going to use this at my co-op class for middle schoolers. Yes, absolutely. That's so awesome. I love working with kids. I had one family that I worked with. This was so fabulous. He was a Boy Scout, and his mom made him be there to learn this. She's like, if I'm making changes, everybody in the family is going to be there. So she brought in dad and the two kids. And this young man was so impressed by what was happening and what he learned that he went back to his Boy Scout troop, and he said, from now on in, I am the chuck wagon master because I am not eating what you guys are going to put in the food. So like, I'm going to learn this and I'm going to be in charge. And he did for like five years. He was the chuck wagon master for his Boy Scout troop. It was amazing. That was great. Hey, Marie, good to see you. Thank you so much for joining in. Erin um, said she asked a bakery which had a ton of cornstarch if their cornstarch was GMO free and they couldn't find the container. And so I'm going to tell you that unless it's, you know, one of those kinds of bakeries where it is, um, you know, organic and they have other GMO free products, chances are it was probably genetically modified cornstarch because that's the cheapest and easiest thing. You know, all of these ingredients, it's about price because it costs more to go through the certification, to go through the processing, to have a clean line, to have all these different things. And so when you don't know what it is, if it is corn, soy, or canola, you have to assume that those three things are automatically genetically modified. Um, I would rather assume that they are than assume that they're not. And I have actually reached out to manufacturers um, on certain things and said, hey, I see that you have cornstarch in here. Is it non-GMO? It doesn't have to be organic. It just has to be verified non-GMO. But even if they don't have the label on it, sometimes it is non-GMO. Um, so Rebecca says, I'm so concerned about synthetic folic acid use because of FDA requirements, and now there's evidence that the FDA is asking companies to mislabel it as folate. Do you know if this is true? Well, there's an argument going on right now. So the answer is, um, I, not yet. We don't have an answer until they make that final ruling. And if they do rule that it has to be listed as, or that it can be, they're not going to say it has to. If they rule that it can be listed as folate, that is going to be a problem because we need folate, not folic acid, not folinic acid. And so we're, we just have to wait and see. It's kind of like what's going on with the food label. Um, some of you may, if you start reading labels at the grocery store, you'll notice that there are three different versions at the moment. And that would be because we were supposed to have a new food label by now. And it was supposed to come out mid-2018. 
And some things happened in government, and so the label didn't go out, and some companies had already geared up. It takes companies sometimes 18 to 24 months to redo all of their packaging, their lines, their, their system. I mean, it, it takes a long time. It's not an easy switch. And so a bunch of companies had already made changes. So now we have all these different labels, and we have all these different symbols, and it's getting more and more confusing. So we need to help people cut through the chaff. Um, but Rebecca, great question, and I am keeping an eye on that one. I'll let you know as soon as I find out. Um, Kathy, thanks so much. I'm sorry that you had to run, but it was great to see you. Maybe you'll see this in the replay. And Andrea just joined. Hi, Andrea. Um, so, you know, we are looking at all of these different things in terms of what we're doing and how we're sharing. And as practitioners, sometimes we feel like we have to know everything. And one of the things that I want to share with you is that you don't have to know everything. You just have to know more than the people that you're serving and be committed to staying informed and up to date so that you can help them move forward. Um, while it's great to feel like you know everything, that's sort of a very exhausting proposition. And so instead, it's about cleaning up what you're doing finding your space, your, um, your changes, working on those, mastering those, and then being able to share that with the people that you're working with a little bit at a time. Because you also don't want to overwhelm them. Like one of the things that happens, and I mean, I did it a long time ago, and I almost all of my colleagues that I talk to, I don't know anyone that hasn't done this. We, we get out of school, and we're so excited. We're about to go out and save the world, and we just overwhelm people. Like I used to be one of those really ugly people at the grocery store. I'm so embarrassed. This is really awful. I would sit there and I would look at other people's grocery carts and I would say, oh, did you know that this has this in it and this is really bad for you and blah, blah, blah. And these people are looking at me like, lady, I just want to go home and eat my Doritos. Like go away. And I finally learned like I don't even look at other people's carts anymore because it's not my responsibility. But sometimes there'll be someone behind me at the grocery store and they'll say, wow, you like, you must eat really healthy. I'm like, yeah, well, I kind of do. I, you know, it's really important to me. Um, what about you? Do you, do you make changes to your diet? Like, are you making changes or I don't know, somehow it comes up. I mean, I'm not that direct. That, that sounds awful. Um, I'm not that direct about it, but sometimes we have conversations and then they wind up going, yeah, I do want to make changes. It's so confusing and so overwhelming and we can kind of go from there. But but don't just attack them with it. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. Um, and, and just to take it one step at a time, you know, learn what you know, master it, and then move forward and share. That's the most important part. Don't keep that information to yourself. Don't hide that knowledge. Share that with the world. Like put it out there, make it bright and glowing because that is how we are going to make changes. You know, when, when they first began to look at the whole clean label initiative, there was a lot of discussion on industry standards across all of the grocery manufacturers association, a lot of the, um, the grocery item manufacturers, you know, dairy producers, um, corn, sugars, all, all different kinds of beverages, all different kinds of producers. And they were talking about, is this a fad or is it a trend? Because a fad only lasts about a year to 18 months. And so they can ride that one out. A trend, on the other hand, is something that they really, they have to stick with because it's something that's going to be really important for them. It's going to force them to have to change. And so we want important information about ingredients and making healthy choices. That is a trend that is here to stay and it is here to grow and it is going to have a lasting difference and you are going to be part of that. So we've got just a couple minutes left. Um, if anybody has any final questions, and um, so I'll just wait for just a second here, see what, if anybody has another question for me. But it has been really great to be here and share with you. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. It's been very fun and interesting to chat with you. As I mentioned, my name is Mira Desi. I am the ingredient guru. And uh, you can find me on Instagram at theingredientguru.com. And I am so excited that you are going to jump in and take my course as part of this whole new wonderful program 
with the Nutritional Therapy Association. It's going to be really, really fabulous. And uh, when you're done with that, I hope that you will come back and connect with me. I do help and support functional medicine and functional nutrition practitioners so that we can work together and make change and, and support the health of the world. It's a big mission. Let's see. So um, Rebecca says, thank you. Thank you so much for being here, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your questions. And um, so, yeah, let's just stay in touch. And, you know, if you have any questions, you can also put them below this. I will check back in later and see if there's any new questions so that I can fill them out for you. Thanks so much, folks. This has been a lot of fun. Take care. Bye.